Hi, this is Terry Cuti, founder of Deep Sea Foundation. You are watching the educational YouTube channel. And I am with Dr. Manas Kersopolo today, who is uh, a board certified plastic surgeon in San Antonio, Texas, specifically working with breast cancer patients and performing a number of different breast reconstruction options, surgically and specially trained in microsurgery. Um, they primarily do uh, deeps and flap reconstruction uh, with his group in San Antonio, but he is also the founder and developer of the Breast Advocate app, and you can find that at breastadvocateapp.com. It's a wonderful decision tool that all those who are affected by breast cancer can use. It's a free app, and so I'd like to welcome you to the program again, Dr. C. Great to be with you again, Terry. Doing yeah. okay? I'm doing good. Still hanging in there, you know, still zooming away during the pandemic. So I've got a great topic today. What is it? What are we talking about? I want to talk to you about expanders. And, and so here's the truth. You know, I've had breast cancer twice. I've had reconstruction, chemo, radiation. And, and usually when a woman or even a man, I, I, I don't even know if men use expanders sometimes. So maybe we can address that. When they say something to me, I usually go, I understand how you feel. I didn't have expanders. And yet, I've talked to you guys about them. I've read about them. I've read about the science behind them. I have gone to medical conferences and talked to the manufacturers, all of the above. And yet, I never had expanders, right or wrong, you know, five years ago, fast forward to now, I can't relate, but I have so many conversations with women about expanders. So it's a medical device. And in the world of breast cancer, you know, none of us would choose any of these procedures that we went through, whether it's implants, autologous reconstruction, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. But this is a medical device that has a very specific purpose. So talk to us about why we use an expander, when it's placed, why some surgeons use it, some don't. Sometimes it's you know, placed by a plastic surgeon. Sometimes it's placed by a breast surgeon. I could talk forever about this topic. And maybe we should do one more um, video, but for now, what can you tell us? So, as you know, there are two main ways to reconstruct a breast, mm -hmm. implants or using your own tissue. When it comes to implant breast reconstruction, you can do that in one stage or a couple of stages. So by one stage, I mean <clears throat> the final implant is placed at the same time as the mastectomy. So that's immediate reconstruction. Lady goes to sleep, has the mastectomy, and wakes up with the final reconstruction. So that sounds very appealing. Unfortunately, it's not possible routinely or all the time because we're very dependent as plastic surgeons on the quality of the mastectomy tissues left behind. And for someone who wants to have the absolute best result and to look the very, very best, it's, it's extremely common to need more than one surgery. So, and because the secondary surgery is when you do other tune-ups like fat injections, for example, to make things look as good as possible, fill in any contour defects from the mastectomy, whatever we need to do to make things look really good. So with the one stage or direct to implant, which is the better way to call it, there's a high revision rate, right? So if you try and get things all done in one go, there's a high chance you'll need a tune-up procedure anyway. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us feel that if that's going to happen, you've got to be really, really selective as to who gets the one stage reconstruction, right? Oh, yeah. Very so. Right, so you need everything to be right. It has to be the right best, the right surgeon you're working with, the right diagnosis, a bunch of things. So most implant-based reconstruction is performed in stages, and the first implant is a temporary implant, and that's the tissue expander. 
and that's expanded over time to get the lady the breast size that uh, is the goal or there or thereabouts. So uh, expanders um, are um, very, very often in a, in a, a tissue expander reconstruction uh, doesn't look anywhere near as nice as the final result is going to look. So it's very much a means to an end. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it preserves the skin envelope that we're saving with a skin sparing mastectomy or a nipple sparing mastectomy. Putting in the expander preserves the space for the final implant, helps you shape the breast a little bit and helps you play around with the size. Okay. So the expander is put in at the same time as the mastectomy. Uh, when you're having an immediate reconstruction, but the expander can also be put in any time after the mastectomy as a delayed reconstruction, right? Mm. So whether you're having an immediate reconstruction or a delayed reconstruction, the tissue expander is usually the first step for an implant breast reconstruction for most women. Mm -hmm. You can put the expander either below the muscle, sub-pec, or on top of the muscle. Traditionally, it's been put under the muscle. So that's the way most of us were taught. Um, the muscle, the pec muscle, the main chest muscle is lifted up off the underlying rib cage, mm -hmm. and you make a space for the expander. So much of the expander is covered by muscle. And then typically we use ADM, which is acellular dermal matrix, to cover the part of the expander that isn't covered by the pec muscle. Okay, so you want full coverage of that expander. You don't want it just under the skin because a lot of people, that's, that's not enough coverage. Uh, you want more padding and more protection. Yeah, okay. everybody's different skin conditions. And that just seems, uh, you know, physically, I, I'm thinking the muscle has more mass to it. The skin doesn't. So I can see where it's under the muscle. Yeah, it's more protective. And yeah. um, it's, it's uh, the better coverage, the better the camouflage of the expander. Uh, you can't see the expander or, or the final implant because the final implant is going to basically go where the expander was put. So they're just swapped out. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a lot of surgeons, I, I think it's fair to say most plastic surgeons are still putting the expander under the muscle because that's the way they were taught. Mm -hmm. Now there are pros and cons to everything in surgery, as you know. Uh, if you, <clears throat> the more tissue you have covering the expander, in this case, muscle, um, the more protection you have of the expander, the more camouflage, uh, the more padding over the expander. Um, there are downsides to putting expanders under the muscle. The procedure is more painful. Um, there's a phenomenon called breast animation or hyperanimation. What that means is that the expander and the final implant, once it's swapped out, being under the muscle, when the lady uses her chest for anything and those muscles are engaged, the muscle contracts because it's doing its job, except now it's pushing down on this expander or implant and it moves it, it moves it up and out towards the armpit and it makes the breast look very funny very strange not natural and i think sometimes even it can contract yeah it looks like you have contractions it's very uneven you don't have the padding anymore because the breast tissue has been removed mm -hmm. it's just skin a thin layer of fat stuck on the muscle it just women don't like it yeah now that that animation or hyper animation goes away once the the, the lady stops using her muscle, whatever she's doing, things just relax and things look fine again. But many women are very subconscious about that animation. And there are certain things, certain activities they'll avoid, especially in groups or around others. Um, 
it, uh, I have lots of, I see lots of women that come in who are unhappy with their implants because they're under the muscle because that's where the expander was placed. That's where everything was placed. So for many women, it's a source of complaint. Um, the other uh, time, uh, the other downside with under the muscle is, especially for women who are getting radiated, uh, what we know now, we used to think that the muscle was protective. Um, what we know now, there have been a few studies now that have shown that the muscle becomes scarred, it's fibrosed by the radiation. And that's what significantly contributes to a lot of the issues that women have uh, with after radiation having had implants. So implants don't do uh, very well, generally speaking, with radiation. And tissue is by far the gold standard. A flap reconstruction is by far the gold standard for anyone who's going to be getting uh, radiation. And then there are other caveats to that, whether you do immediate reconstruction with, with the mastectomy and flap at the same time, or you, you leave the reconstruction until after the radiation. That's a whole other topic for another yeah. video, perhaps. But, but generally speaking, implants and radiation don't go well together. Right. The other, uh, the other position for the expander and therefore the final implant is on top of the muscle, and that's called a prepec. And so a lot of us now have really moved towards that. As I said, it's, it's still not the mainstream, but more and more plastic surgeons are kind of getting on board with that technique. <clears throat> the... Uh, expander is basically placed on top of the muscle where the breast tissue was. And ADM, which is that, that mesh-like material that I mentioned before, a cellular matrix, that's, that's usually a human product. There are different products on the market. The ones that are most popular are actually human products that are freeze-dried and treated so that all the cells are removed and the only thing that's left is the framework. So it's like a collagen framework that basically uh, provides extra covering and support for that expander. So we, there are different techniques, but basically now because you're putting the expander on top of the muscle, you use the ADM to wrap it, uh, to cover it, uh, some of us do a full wrap all the way around because we feel that that decreases the risk of significant scarring and it helps keep the breast soft. Other people, other surgeons just cover the front of it, the front of the expander. But a wrap of some sort is, is used for most pre-PEC tissue expanders. That <clears throat> saves the muscle. It doesn't raise the muscle off the chest. Um, that muscle preservation uh, makes the recovery a lot easier okay. and also completely avoids the breast animation that I mentioned, the abnormal movement, because now the muscle is in its normal place. So the downside to pre-PEC uh, reconstruction with implants is now you've got less covering. So now you're more likely to see the final implant, um, and we call that rippling, and you basically see the waves in the shell of the implant. Mm -hmm. So there are different techniques we use to address that. Um, number one is fat injections, fat grafting. Mm -hmm. So over a third of women who have direct-to-implant reconstruction need fat grafting as a secondary procedure mm -hmm. to camouflage those ripples, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the secondary stage in our practice, a tissue expander lady, she'll have another surgery once she's fully expanded. The procedures are typically three months apart. They have to be at least three months for insurance to cover it. They have to be outside your 90 day global. So the tissue expander um, is left in place at the beginning of the surgery. We do liposuction. 
then we inject the fat that we've got gotten from the liposuction we purify it and that allows us to inject the fat that's lipofilling or fat grafting and with the expander still in place we inject over the expander where we can see we need the most mm -hmm. you don't you want to be really careful doing fat grafting with the final implant in place because you don't want to poke the implant so that's why i do most of the injections if not all in most patients with the expander in place then that makes total sense i didn't even sense, right? so then then you remove the expander um i like to use the same incision some surgeons use a different incision um we remove the expander do any internal modification that we need uh, and then maybe a little bit more fat in is injected at that point where, where we can see with nothing in where there are some additional contour issues um, and then the last thing we do is we put in the, the, the permanent implant. So <clears throat> implant technology has come a long way. So now we have a lot of different implants to choose from. And the gummy bear implants are particularly important for breast reconstruction patients because, and there are different manufacturers. Um, some manufacturers are, have implants that are more gummy than others and all gummy means is that um do you like jelly babies gummy bears i got some in my pantry <laughs> okay do you just pop them in your mouth or do you do you eat their head first do you like eat half of it and then you look no. at it or did you ever, have you ever done that i just ripped the package open and I took a step. Okay, so ne the next, <laughs> the next gummy bear you eat, just eat half of it and take a look inside, right? And so gummy bear implants, if you were to slice them open, the silicone is much more, it's much more cohesive. It's much thicker. It sticks together more. The previous, so if you go back a couple of generations, the silicone was a lot thinner, and you could actually. Yeah, really really stringy and stuff. so now you can slice it and do this and nothing falls out you can try and squeeze it but it stays in there so it's much more cohesive it's much thicker so the idea is a a, a softer natural feeling without it without that oozing that that they that right. it used to have but it's still fine. maintaining yeah i that it's makes it's a good ex, good explanation and it maintains it bears differently yeah and the implants maintain their form better yeah so they hold their shape better but they also ripple a lot less so mm -hmm. for a pre pec patient the combination of a highly cohesive implant a gummy bear implant and fat injections um, usually that's enough to uh, really not need the muscle coverage that we needed before to cover the implant that's how we get around the padding issue and camouflaging the implant okay. and so you can get a very nice pretty natural result now with prepec techniques and the other benefit of prepec looks it, it seems to be far more beneficial in the setting of radiation mm -hmm. um, to use a prepec technique rather than going under the muscle because the ADM all the way around the implant seems to be protective and the impact of radiation which is usually a lot of breast hardening around the implant um, like I said before the muscle tightens up it scars up and, it, and, and as things scar they become shorter mm -hmm. and so if you've got a muscle that's covering the implant or the expander and you radiate it, it basically pulls everything up. And so radiated women who have had implants or expanders and then got radiated, it's very common to see that final implant over time. Mm -hmm. We say radiation is the gift that keeps on giving. Yep. Okay. And so over time it gets worse and worse and it rises higher the, the implant rises higher on the chest and it can get hard and it can become really uncomfortable, very, very tight.
Yeah. And, and so there have been a couple of studies now that have shown that pre-PEC implants in conjunction with the ADM, uh, do they tolerate radiation better? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the muscle is spared, so you don't have that so much tightening and you don't have the scarred radiated muscle pulling up the implant anymore. They just do, they just do better. Mm -hmm. so for women who don't want tissue, they want to avoid scarring anywhere else on their body, they're not good candidates for a tissue reconstruction, or that frankly, they're just not ready and they want to limit their surgery to the breast, and, and implants is what they want, a pre-PEC technique is way better than uh, a sub-PEC technique. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the most common uh, use of implants, uh, sorry, of tissue expanders. Mm -hmm. It's for staged implant reconstruction. And implants are used probably 80% of, of breast reconstructions in this country mm -hmm. use implants mostly yep. tissue expanders yes um, there are some women who want tissue reconstruction mm -hmm. as their final method of reconstruction but they uh, some of them uh, will have tissue expanders placed temporarily too so mm -hmm. one situation is the delayed immediate reconstruction so what that means is the lady's going to be getting radiation and as i said before radiation impacts the reconstruction radiation impacts all the all tissues mm -hmm. okay and all reconstruction methods mm -hmm. um, it causes tissues to shrink up and become a little bit firmer mm -hmm. it changes the color of the skin um, it can affect the deeper tissues too so patients really need to talk very very honestly with their radiation oncologists uh, radiation techniques have come a really long way, but the biggest thing we can't control still is the patient's biologic response to it. Yes. So, you know, we've, I've seen sisters who have had the same diagnosis, same treatment, one tolerates radiation way better than the other, and it's genetics, okay? And we can't control for that. Mm -hmm. So there are things now in terms of the techniques, the way in which radiation is given and performed, um, techniques that protect the heart more, protect the lungs more, so that there's less risk to those other deeper organs. Uh, but still, radiation isn't benign. There are, just like surgery, right? There are, there are risks. Absolutely. So... In delayed immediate reconstruction, for someone who's going to be getting a flap, going to be getting tissue as their final means of reconstruction, the idea is that the expander is placed for, at the time of the mastectomy, mm -hmm. then the patient has their radiation, and then the expander is exchanged for the flap. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that way the lady gets her flap and the flap is spared so the flap isn't subjected to the radiation and so it doesn't shrink it doesn't get harder uh, you can still do a flap reconstruction and then go on and get radiation mm -hmm. but you really need to seek out radiation oncologists that are very familiar and experienced with radiating breast reconstruction patients because even though protocols are the same they're not mm -hmm. and it takes and a great some, deal of coordinated care a lot so the multidisciplinary approach is crucial for any breast cancer patient but for the reconstruction patient in particular you need to have close communication between your reconstructive surgeon, your breast surgeon, and your radiation oncologist because there is an evidence-based approach to radiating people just like there is with any treatment. Mm -hmm. And breast reconstruction needs to be considered in the decision algorithm. There are certain things that a radiation oncologist can scale back on yeah. to protect the reconstruction and limit the damage whilst still prioritizing their cancer care.
Uh, there are some things they can't scale back on, and it's life before rest. But there is a happy place there. There is a happy medium if you find the right people. Okay. So going back to the delayed immediate, you can have the expander, finish your radiation with the expander in place, then you go on and have your definitive reconstruction with the flap. Okay. Putting in the expander at the time of the mastectomy preserves the skin envelope. The more natural skin that you preserve, the better the final result from a cosmetic standpoint, the less scarring you have mm -hmm. and the less obvious patch like appearance you have mm -hmm. on the chest right so because you're keeping that skin expanded mm -hmm. out to length yeah and so it doesn't shrink down it's not removed um you're facing, to the chest wall yeah you're using it as a spacer to yeah. keep things out length and then you can just change out the filling, mm -hmm. right? So delayed immediate, that's a very useful tool. Mm -hmm. uh, the other time expanders are used um, is creating more skin envelope mm -hmm. when you don't have it, right? So a lady who's had a delayed reconstruction who, wants a f who doesn't have any extra skin left, Okay. Um, who wants a flap to use her own tissue? Some surgeons will offer to put an expander in first, expand out, and recreate the breast skin envelope, mm -hmm. and then do the flap in order to limit the amount of skin they need to leave showing on the outside. So it decreases the patch of skin. Mm -hmm. So it improves your cosmetic outcome. Um, yeah, pros and cons. Um, more surgery is always more risk. Um, expanders can get infected. They're not always comfortable. They're not, um, especially when you go under the muscle you know, um, they're not much fun, right? So there's always risk. And so that needs to be considered in the discussion and the decision making process, because some women may be risk averse. Mm -hmm. and just look, doc, let's just do delayed reconstruction. I'm fine with a bigger patch of skin showing. That's okay. Let's focus on the shape. I'm okay with the scarring. Other women may say, oh man, I, I can't deal with that patch of skin showing. So give me the expander, create the overall basic shape of the breast, and let's limit my scarring. I want to prioritize my cosmetic outcome. But okay. then, you know, they got to they gotta have that expander in for a while. Yeah, I mean, I've had ladies that have flown through that and have done great, and I've had other ladies, you know, they've had radiation, the expander, breaks through the skin, it gets infected, or this kind of, now they've bought themselves more surgery that they could have avoided had they just kept things simple mm -hmm. and just had a delayed reconstruction with a flap just, and just accepted the additional scarring. So pros and cons. Yeah. Um, the other time an expander is beneficial is if someone is a candidate for an immediate reconstruction, wants a flap, but can't get a flap where they live. So, for us, for example, PRMA, as you know, we see a lot of people from all over the place. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those folks don't have access to a microsurgeon locally. So what they'll do is, you know, we'll get on the phone with the breast surgeon and hopefully also the local plastic surgeon. And we'll come up with a plan. The local plastic surgeon can put in a tissue expander at the same time as the mastectomy. So the patient gets her immediate reconstruction. She gets to save all her skin or a skin sparing mastectomy or even her nipple, hopefully sometimes, nipple sparing mastectomy. So all that is preserved. She gets through her treatment locally in the comfort of her own surroundings with some support. And then that person travels for their definitive reconstruction once all the other treatment is done. So that way, you get the same outcome mm -hmm. 
it's an, it's an additional step, but it's a very powerful tool, right? And it, well, it also it buys time for yeah. that patient because if they think they want something, but they're not sure, they've got this diagnosis to deal with, it's very emotional, they've got a million things to weigh up in their minds, and they just can't take one more decision, they're just not ready, it buys you time. Yeah. And it can also buy time, you know, there are ladies in whom we don't know for sure if they're gonna get radiation or not. Yeah. So you can put in an expander and, you know, burn low bridges as it were, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so those are, those, are the, those are the main indications for expanders. Yeah. I mean, I think everything you bring up in this, in the presence of, of implants, they're certainly important. And, you know, for delayed reconstruction, whether it's autologous or, um, you know, even in implant setting, if, if there's going to be radiation, there's just a number of settings that implants mm -hmm. can be used. And so I guess from a patient advocate's standpoint, I would just wrap up by saying, you know, I hope that viewers get to watch this. You added so many good points. Um, but, you know, know also that these medical devices are tested in research, in studies. Ask about it when you go to your consult. Ask about those studies and ask about the safety and efficacy of them um, and also what the purpose of them uh, are for because they're certainly for different situations as you mm -hmm. pointed out so thanks for outlining all of those for us today and taking the time yeah always all Pleasure. right good to see you again take care Tony. all right you too bye